The scattering problem that we want to solve is, is known for you. It is just that we have an incident field. This incident field is the field that exists in the absence of the scattering object. Then we have the scattering object and we have a scatter field produced by the scattering object. Remember that the scatter field is defined as the difference between the total field minus the incident field. That is, the total field is the here, the total field is the field existing in, in the presence of the object and the incident field is the field in the absence of the object, with no object. So that the difference field, total minus incident, is defined as the scatter field and it is the field due to the presence of the object. And you know that this is the same field as in chapter 2 we, when we were uh, studying the equivalence theorem, this scatter field is an equivalence theorem, the field due to the equivalent uh, sources, the equivalent currents. Okay, so uh, how can we solve the, the, the scattering problem? Well, essentially, if we know the induced current and charges at the surface of the scatter, or the equivalent uh, currents at the surface, then we can use the radiation equations in free space to compute the scatter fields. Because remember, remember that the scatter field in equivalence theorem was the field due to the uh, equivalent uh, currents. Okay, so we know the equivalent currents that for perfectly conducting objects are equal to the induced currents and charges, then we can use the free space radiation equations to obtain the scatter field. And if we know the scatter field at far at, at a very large distance are towards infinity, a very large distance from the object, that is we can use the far field approximation and radiation uh, approximation, then we can compute the RCS which is the important parameter for uh, radar scattering. Well, the problem, as you know, is that it is no tri it's not trivial to obtain the equivalent currents or the induced currents at the surface of the radar target. We have to solve an uh, integral equation or a differential equation. We have to solve it numerically through discretization. And this is what we have seen in chapter 3. So in chapter 3, we have seen that we have some Maxwell's equations or wave equations in the case of differential equation methods, or we have some integral equations in the case of integral equation methods that together with the definition of the incident field, the definition of the object surface, the boundary conditions, and in the case of differential equation, we also need the radiation conditions or truncation conditions using all this together with our differential or integral equations, we can discretize with method of moments or with finite element method or with finite difference time domain and obtain a linear system or an iteration in the case of finite difference time domain. And this is our numerical solution. And this is what we have seen in chapter three. And there is a lot of commercial software that uh, can do this. Uh, we, ha we have seen some examples of commercial software in chapter 3 and of course we have our this Fiesta software. This Fiesta 3D is not, uh, this is our in-house uh, software. Fiesta in this case does not, does not mean a three-dimensional part. It is just a fast integral equation solver for scatterers and antennas. So it's not a part, it's just a, our own um, three-dimensional Sol solver based on integral e equations with uh, fast uh, solvers that we use for to develop to not it's not commercial we use just it for developing new uh, fast solver techniques etc. Okay, but there are apart from these numerical methods that we know from chapter three. Apart from this, there is something else. We have the old analytical exact solution. 
This here, these are analytical solutions. The cities are very old, the oldest solutions. Maybe 100 years before uh, numerical uh, software. And it is possible only for canonical geometries. And we will dedicate the rest of this video to explain you how it is possible to formulate uh, analytical solutions in the case of canonical geometries. And the next videos will be uh, dedicated to analyze simple cases with uh, simple cases of canonical geometries like the infinite cylinder and the wedge, the sphere, etc. But apart from numerical so simulation, numerical solutions, and apart from analytical solutions, we also have approximate solutions. These approximate solutions are asymptotic, are asymptotic in the sense that they work when the size of the object is very large compared to the wavelength. The size means the all the dimensions, the length, the width, the physical dimensions must be much larger than the wavelength, but also the radius of curvature of the surfaces must be much larger than the wavelength. In this case, we have very interesting asymptotic approximate solutions like physical optics, geometrical or physical theory of diffraction, ray tracing, that is RT, etc. And these are called high frequency methods because they work when the size is much larger of the, the size of the object is much larger than the wavelength. And a very and a small wavelength means a high frequency. So if we want the wavelength to be small, this means that the frequency must be high. So often these are valid at frequencies of gigahertz, but from the point of view of 20th century. These are high frequencies. In 21st century, maybe gigahertz are low frequency because now we are in millimeter waves, terahertz, etc. But from the point of view of 20th century, these are high frequencies. So these methods are called high frequency methods. And they are important because it is in the high frequency region when the size of the object is la much larger than the wavelength that the numerical methods fail because the number of unknowns becomes too large. Remember that in numerical methods, in numerical methods, we need a discretization step delta or h of the order uh, lambda over 10 or so. And since lambda is much smaller than the than the wavelength, the the discretization step is much, much, much smaller than the size of the object. So you have millions or thousands of millions of small triangles in the discretization that becomes thousands of millions of unknowns. And then you need a very efficient fast solvers, a supercomputer, or you can even uh, not solve the problem. And this is exactly the region, the high frequency region, where the high frequency methods work very well. And for that reason, they are important. So the last videos of chapter uh, four will be dedicated to these uh, high frequency methods. Let's see, let's see how is it, it is possible to, we'll dedicate now a few slides to canonical problems with analytical solution. So let's see uh, how is it, it is possible to to obtain an analytical uh, solution. First, we must uh, use a coordinate system in which the wave equation is uh, separable. And that is, for example, in Cartesian coordinates. Cartesian coordinates is the simplest case, the simplest example, and you know very well Cartesian coordinates. And you know that uh, the wave equation is separable in Cartesian coordinates, we can separate the wave equation like this if we separate the solution like this, okay? And in this case, we can we get three equations of one variable, x, y, or z, three equations with one, one variable, and we can solve these equations analytically if 
the boundary conditions are set on surfaces of constant coordinates. You already know uh, this case, for example, in this case would be the reflection on an infinite uh, plane. If the plane is infinite, okay, we can set uh, the coordinate, the, the boundary condition of the tangent component of electric field uh, at a constant, if this is, for example, y-axis, known for y equal to y0, here y0 is the constant y-coordinate of the plane, we set the boundary condition, and then uh, we can solve the, the wave equation in y-direction, and we get some plane waves, etc., etc. You already know that. But let's see an example a slightly more complicated than the Cartesian coordinate case. And it is uh, uh, the example of the infinite uh, circular cylinder. Later, we will dedicate a complete video with many slides to the formulation of the solution, uh, analytical solution in these problems. But here, I just show you uh, the, the procedure of separation of, of variables for the circular cylinder. We have the wave equation, and now the wave equation is formulated in polar, sorry, in polar coordinates. And we separate the solution, the solution for the potential, in polar coordinates. So it is the product of a, of a function of the distance rho. Remember that dot rho is the distance to the set axis. Uh, another function of the angle phi, remember the angle phi, you know it very well, and the other coordinate is the another, and then another function of the set coordinate. So you get the solution represented as the product of three functions of one variable, one variable of each coordinate. And you set the boundary condition at a surface of constant coordinates. For example, the boundary condition would be a constant potential or tangent component of electric field equal to zero, or whatever. In this case, we have uh, the wave equation for the potential, so the boundary condition would be constant potential on a perfectly conducting surface. And the perfectly conducting surface is a surface of constant coordinate rho equal to rho zero. So function f of rho at coordinate rho zero, the potential at rho zero is equal to the known potential, let's say B zero, for example. Okay, this is very important because now we can solve, I will show you later in the next video how to solve uh, the problem and, how, and we will show you the solutions that we get. But for the moment, we here we stick only to the, to the case uh, to, to explain the separation of variables. So, we have the wave equation, we represent the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates, and the, the Laplacian of phi in cylindrical coordinates becomes this sum of three terms, a term with the derivative with respect to rho, another term with the derivative with respect to phi, and another term with the derivative with respect to, to set coordinate, and here, we replace the potential we replace the potential using everywhere using our product of three functions of one variable so function f of rho g of phi and function h of z and then using doing the replacement we get three equations one equation of set coordinate another equation of phi coordinate and another equation of rho coordinate. The equation of uh, set coordinate is just a standard wave equation in set and we get the conventional harmonic solution that are plane, wa plane waves. In phi coordinate, we again obtain a standard wave equation and here the only thing is that our wave number n is integer so n must be integral number, okay? But uh, again, we get harmonic solutions. Now the harmonic solutions are in phi, 
so they are just the conventional sinus and cosinus of n phi, okay? But in rho coordinate we get something different. In rho coordinate we get this differential equation. And this is not a, a standard wave equation uh, with harmonic uh, with solutions that are harmonic functions. This is something different. This is a differential equation and the solutions of this differential equation are defined as Bessel or Hankel functions. So these are these H functions that are Hankel functions. So in summary, our, our solutions are the following. In set direction, we got plane waves. Plane wave in set and the wave number of this plane wave is K set. In phi, uh, we got, again, harmonic functions. Harmonic functions that are exponentials of j and phi that you know that are cosinus and sinus, for example, cosinus for the real part and sinus for the imaginary part, cosinus and sinus of n phi. So they are the typical harmonic solutions in phi. And the solution of the differential equation in rho was defined as the Hankel function. And the Hankel function, or in this case the argument is rho, is k rho, rho. These Hankel functions are defined as complex functions such that the real part is the first kind Bessel function and the imaginary part is the second kind Bessel function. And in this case, for here, the second kind Hankel function, these two here, the sign is minus. And for first kind uh, Hankel function, we should obtain a plus uh, sign, okay? So, and here we have also a condition that links the wave number in set direction with the argument k rho in rho direction. We have a equation that links these two wave numbers with k, which is the wave number in free space. Remember that k is the wave number in free space, okay? And we have a relation between the three wave numbers, the free space one, the wave number in side of the plane waves in side direction, and the wave number k rho that is the argument of the of the Bessel function. Okay. This is analogous to the condition that we get in Cartesian coordinates. When we do the separation of variables here in Cartesian coordinates, I didn't uh, say that, but uh, here we can split this, we can split it like this. And, the, and what we got is equivalent to this. So the equivalent to this equation in cylindrical coordinates is k rho square plus k set square equal to k square. And now some, just yes, some insight on the Bessel functions. For you, Bessel functions are the solutions of a differential equation in the same way as, in the same way as the sinus and cosinus are solutions of that equation, if we have a function phi, the sinus and cosinus are solutions of that uh, function. The sinus and cosinus are solutions of that function. The Bessel, the Bessel of, sorry, the sinus and cosinus are solutions of that uh, differential equation. The Bessel functions are solutions of that differential equation. And for, so for you, it must be something equivalent as sinus and cosinus, but for a different differential equation. The only difference is that in your calculator, you have implemented the computation of sinus and cosinus, but you don't have in your calculator Bessel function. 
but you do have Bessel functions, for example, in MATLAB. So if you use MATLAB, Bessel functions are the same as sinus and cosinus. You just compute them using the MATLAB uh, corresponding MATLAB function. Okay? And to show you an example, in this graph here, we compare the cosinus in blue color with the Bessel function uh, J of first kind and order zero in red color. And we see that both functions, the cosinus and the Bessel functions, are oscillatory. The period is approximately the same. The only difference is that the Bessel function has an attenuation. The amplitude of the cosinus is constant and the Bessel function has an attenuation. In particular, we can observe that for very large arguments, the Hankel function, which is the, the, expo the complex function of real part uh, e equal to a Bessel function of first kind, an imaginary part equal to a Bessel function of second kind, this function is equivalent to the exponential. Remember that the exponential has real part a cosinus an imaginary part as a sinus, okay? So, if we agree that the Bessel function of first kind is equivalent to a cosinus and the Bessel function of second kind is equivalent to a sinus, then we have to agree that the Hankel function is the equivalent as the complex exponential. A complex exponential represents propagation of plane waves. In the same way, the Hankel function represents the propagation of cylindrical waves. Cylindrical waves, okay? And, and the, the, the complex exponential is plane waves. So, we have this parallelism sinus and cosinus and complex exponential are plane waves and Bessel functions of first and second kind Hankel functions are cylindrical waves. And here the attenuation that I mentioned before, this attenuation that I, I said, this attenuation of the Bessel functions plays a role because you know that a cylindrical wave when it propagates it must have the field of a cylindrical wave must attenuate as uh, 1 over the square root of rho, where rho is the, rho is the distance to the z-axis, so rho the distance to the z-axis, okay? And the uh, electrical field in a, plane, in a cylindrical wave must attenuate as 1 over square root of rho. And this is what we got from if we do the large argument approximation of the Hankel function, what we get is that it attenuates an, as 1 over the square root of the argument. And remember that the argument is k rho rho, so rho it attenuates as the 1 over the square root of rho, the same as the attenuation of the electric field in a cylindrical wave. So everything agrees with the fact that this Hankel and Bessel functions represent, represent cylindrical waves. In particular, in the same way as a complex exponential with a negative argument is a plane wave, a plane wave propagating to the right and a complex exponential with positive argument is a plane wave propagating to the left in the same way as this the complex exponential sorry the, the complex Hankel function with positive sign here represent a ingoing wave a wave that propagates towards the z axis and a Hankel function with a negative sign represents an outgoing wave that is a cylindrical wave that propagates away from
from the z axis so the same as this in the same as in planar wave the sign of the argument determines the sense of propagation to the left or to the right here with Hankel functions, it is again the sign of the imaginary part that determines the sense of propagation of, of cylindrical waves to be towards the set axis, set axis ingoing or away from the set axis outgoing. And <clears throat> We can obtain analytical solutions not only for the cylindrical system that uh, the cylindrical coordinate system that I have shown you as an example, but for many more coordinate systems. In fact, there are 13 coordinate systems in which the Helmholtz equation is uh, separable. The, the Helmholtz equation okay, is separable into 13 coordinate uh, systems. The ones that you know very well are Cartesian, cylindrical and spherical. You know these three very well, so there is nothing new with them. But there are many others, and in the same way that you can solve a cylinder, an infinite cylinder in cylindrical coordinates, or you can solve a sphere with a spherical coordinates, or a plane with Cartesian coordinates, you can analyze, for example, an spheroid, using spheroidal coordinates or you can analyze an infinite elliptical cylinder okay infinite elliptical cylinder infinite here using elliptic cylindrical coordinates so the shapes the canonical they are called canonical uh, objects the canonical objects that have constant coordinates in this coordinate in one of these coordinate systems are the objects for which we can obtain an analytical solution. There are a few very well known examples. For example, the circular cylinder that I have shown you before is a surface that has constant row coordinate in cylindrical coordinates. But also, for example, in cylindrical coordinates, the wedge that is infinite in here. In fact, the wedge is made by the inter with is limite the, the two surfaces that limit the wedge are two infinite semi planes. Okay, so the wedge is like this, and it is a surface of constant phi coordinate in cylindrical coordinates. Of course, in Cartesian coordinates, you have the infinite plane that have constant coordinate in x y or z uh, axis okay these are known examples maybe the maybe the wedge is, is new for you and in a spherical coordinates we have of course the sphere the sphere has constant radius in a spherical coordinates and the cone also in a spherical coordinates the cone has constant theta uh, a, su a surface of constant theta coordinate equal to theta zero okay and these are the examples that, that we have. And apart from these easy and well-known examples in the three well-known coordinate systems, remember that we have many more coordinate systems, 10 more coordinate systems in which the Helmholtz equation or wave equation is separable. And there are quite a, a few uh, more canonical geometries, for example, ellipsoids, paraboloids, spheroids, uh, these confocal are for objects of two, of two separate ellipsoids equal to each other, or paraboloids, etc. So there are, and toroid, of course, the case of the toroid in toroidal co coordinates, we can, we can solve the Helmholtz, the homogeneous Helmholtz equation also for a toroid, which is an uh, interesting case also. So, and the biospherical two spheres, two separate spheres. So there are not only 
the well-known objects in the well-known, the three well-known car, uh, coordinate uh, systems, as Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical, but also ten more coordinate systems with a lot of objects for which the analytical solution is possible. We will consider here only the easy cases that are cylindrical or spherical, of course. The, for Cartesian coordinates, the canonical object is the infinite plane. And for infinite plane, you know, you already know how to compute the reflection in an infinite plane using image theory. So there is nothing interesting in Cartesian coordinates. The easy cases for which we can obtain interesting solutions are cylindrical and spherical coordinates and are the cases that we will analyze analyze in the remaining of this chapter 3. Of course, we will not address here, of course, the, let's say, difficult, because they are truly difficult. We will not address in this chapter of the solutions in the 10 difficult coordinate systems, only the three easy ones. Um, Cartesian is not interesting because it's in the reflection from an infinite plane is computed with image theory. So here we will concentrate only in cylindrical and spherical, which are the easy but also interesting solutions. To obtain analytical solutions for canonical objects, we need some tools, and these tools are mainly the wave transformations and the addition theorems. The wave transformations are equations that or formulas to express wave functions of one coordinate system, like for example plane wave in Cartesian coordinates, in terms of wave functions of another coordinate system, for example cylindrical waves. So we will see in the next slide how we can write a plane wave in terms of a summation, infinite summation of cylindrical waves. That is waves in one coordinate system expressed in terms or as a function of waves in another coordinate system. But we also need addition theorems. Addition theorems are just a coordinate shift, coordinate origin shift, that is, we want to express waves in one coordinate system in terms of waves at the same of the same coordinate system but with uh, origin at a different point. For example, a very simple case that you would know very well is the plane wave. For example, for the plane wave, if we have here our, sorry, this is X, if we have our Cartesian coordinate system, and this is uh, point R, and we want to express th this the plane wave not in terms of R with respect to the coordinate origin, but in terms of R prime, that is the radius with respect to some other point R zero different than the original coordinate system zero. No? So we move from R equal to zero to R prime with origin at R0. We move from that origin to R prime with uh, origin uh, at R0. But this is not exactly 0. Okay. So what we do, we just replace, this is a very simple change of variable, we just replace R equal to R prime plus R0 and we get this. And this is our wave, sorry, our addition theorem in Cartesian coordinates. This is very simple, very well known, but this is just to let you understand what is the addition theorem because we will see a much, a much more complex notation, a much more complex formula in cylindrical and spherical coordinates. And these tools, wave transformation and addition theorems are essential because they are not only used for can analytical solutions in can with canonical geometries, but also in numerical methods and in near to far field transformations in antennas, measurement, etc. 
or and imagine there are a lot of, of topics where you can apply this uh, equation, these transformations and addition theorems. For example, in cylindrical coordinates, well, we have the plane wave. The plane wave is in Cartesian coordinates, okay? This is Cartesian coordinates, well, a plane wave that propagates towards x-axis, positive x-axis. And here we want to represent it in cylindrical coordinates. So in cylindrical coordinates, we just replace x equal to rho cosinus phi, okay? But we still have the... Com now we have replaced the Cartesian variable by polar variables, okay, in cylindrical coordinates, but still the complex exponential is still the wave function in Cartesian coordinates. And we want to express this as wave functions in cylindrical coordinates. So we use some identity and we get this, that the complex exponential is the infinite summation of j to minus n times a, comple uh, a Bessel function, first kind order n of k rho, times the complex exponential of n phi. And this is our wave transformation from plane wave to uh, cylindrical wave. If we change the sign of the exponential and now for, for plane wave propagating in the opposite sense, this change of sign goes here and we only have to change that sign here. Okay. As I said you, as I said before, and this Jn is the Bessel function of first kind and order n. Okay, and, and what is very interesting here is that in this infinite summation, you don't need to sum infinite uh, terms because the Bessel function of order n and argument x is approximately zero for, uh, sorry, approximately zero for n for large n. How large? Well, for n much larger than x. In particular, normally for n larger than x plus 10 or so, um, it is almost uh, zero. You can neglect all the remaining terms. Here, the argument x is k rho. And if a is the radius of the, for example, the radius of the cylinder, a is the radius of the cylinder, or whatever, or at least a, a is the maximum possible value of rho, then we only have to sum up to uh, k n plus 10. We can sum up to play n plus 5 and have a uh, um, worse degree, uh, worse error, larger error in, in the in the truncation of the se infinite series, or we can sum up to Ka plus 15, for example, and have a smaller error. But normally, Ka, pl Ka plus 10 is usually okay and provides a very good uh, truncation error. And also very important, we have to formulate the Green's function in cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Remember that the Green's function is the impulse response. The Green's function is the impulse response. And in Cartesian coordinates, in 3D Cartesian coordinates, obviously, uh, we have a point at the origin that is our source, for example, a point charge for the scalar potential, and this produces the, our, our potential, and then our potential is the well-known uh, three-dimensional Green's function in Cartesian coordinates for a point source. But, for example, in cylindrical coordinates, we have only two dimensions because everything is constant in set dimension, so we only have x and y variables because everything is constant in z, and our point source, that point source is the, is the source that produces the, the impulse response, the potential equal to the Green's function, 
our point source must be constant in set direction so it is a wire the point source is equal to a wire okay infinite wire of course infinite that goes from zeta equal to minus infinite to zeta set, set equal to minus infinite to set equal to to plus infinite now our Green's function in in cylindrical coordinates will be the potential due to an infinite wire so we have to integrate the potential due to a point source from set equal to minus infinite up to set equal to plus infinite. We do the integration and we obtain this. We obtain the Hankel function of order zero and second kind. Remember that second kind Hankel functions are outward traveling waves, that is waves that propagate away from the set axis. Okay? And we get this uh, Hankel function of order zero, second kind over 4j. You already know this from Practical Project 2 because in Practical Project 2 you obtained a numerical solution of the electric and magnetic field integral equations and it was a two-dimensional problem so in two dimensions you had to use the two-dimensional Green's function that were this one. Okay, in the, K, in the TM case which is the easy case all the vectors uh, have uh, vectors, I mean the electric field vector, the current, and the vector potential, all of them have the set direction and the Green's function for the electric, uh, electric uh, vector potential and the, also the static the potential or scalar potential are equal to this g to d okay in the te case uh, is different the te case it, the solution is different and you already know that from the from practical project uh, two and what are the addition theorems in cylindrical coordinates well in cylindrical coordinates when we shift the coordinate origin from from the from zero to rho prime that is we shift our we shift our line uh, source from from the coordinate origin is shifted to rho prime so now the new source is located at rho prime. The Bessel function with origin at rho prime is represented as a summation of Bessel functions with origin at rho, infinite summation for the Bessel function of the first kind, something similar for the Bessel function of the second kind, but now we have two different formulas depending if we are evaluating we evaluate uh, let's change the color we evaluate at rho okay so if rho the evaluation point rate the position of the evaluation point rho is larger than the position of the source rho prime we have uh, one equation here and if it is less than rho prime we have another equation. So we have two formulas depending if rho is larger or smaller than rho prime. So we join these two Bessel, these two addition theorems for the Bessel functions and the real and imaginary part of the Hankel function, what we get is this. We get the addition theorem for the Hankel function, that is this, and this is important because the Hankel function, remember that is the two-dimensional the Hankel function over 4j is the two-dimensional Green's function the Green's function in two-dimensional problems in cylindrical coordinates 
So this is important because this is the way to shift the line, the line source as impulse response in our convolution. So in analytical solutions, when we compute the convolution of the green function or impulse response with the sources, we have to shift the green function and analytically we can shift it using this uh, infinite series summation. And remember that we do not need to sum infinite terms because remember that the that the Bessel function becomes very small for order much larger than the argument. So the same as before, we only need to to compute Bessel functions and terms in the summation for orders that are just uh, k rho, the maximum k rho, uh, plus some fixed quantity like 10 or something. Well, in spherical coordinates, we have something very similar. The, plan, the plane waves are expressed in as a summation of spherical waves, like this, very similar to what we have with cylindrical waves. But now there is one difference, important difference. We use our spherical wave functions. The spherical wave functions are the product of spherical Bessel functions. The spherical Bessel functions are represented in lowercase, lowercase j, lowercase y, and lowercase h. They are represented in lowercase and are related with the standard Bessel functions by this formula. In fact, they are Bessel functions of order of integer order plus one half times some function of, of the argument. Okay? So these are the spherical Bessel functions and the spherical waves are the product of spherical Bessel functions of Kr times a Legendre polynomial of cosinus of, of theta. We have also our addition theorem for Hankel functions and our additional theorem is very similar to that of for cylindrical Hankel fi functions, but now for spherical Hankel functions we have to replace all Bessel and Hankel functions by lowercase versions. Okay, we have the lowercase versions, and we also have a different coefficient here. We have a different coefficient. We have the the Legendre polynomials, but very important, we have to replace the Hankel functions and Bessel functions by the lowercase versions that are the spherical ones. Okay, here this argument of the Legendre polynomial, this cosinus of xi, of, of xi is this, a function of theta and, and phi. Okay, and this is the definition of the spherical Bessel Hankel function, the spherical Hankel functions very equal to that of the spherical Bessel function. Okay, do you, you do not have to learn all these equations by, by heart? Of course not. You don't have to know them. They are in Balani's book. They, of course, they are in many books. They are in the, in the all books of about electromagnetism have some appendix on Bessel functions. So see, appendix on Bessel functions. In all books of, of electromagnetism, for example, in this course, we, I have recommended the, the book by Balanis. Okay, for example, Balanis' book is one recommended in the bi 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 bibliography of this course. And you have all the equations there. Of course, you also have the equations in these slides. So, if you need these equations, for example, remember that there was an optional assignment that an optional assignment. If you want to do that optional assignment, you need all these wave transformations and addition theorems in cylindrical coordinates. So you can use these equations that are on the slides or on the Bessel functions appendix at, at all the books.